نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرخ لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احلل عقدتا من لسانی یفقه قولی و جعل لی وزیر من اخلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین اللہم الہمنا رشدا و عزنا من شدور انفسنا اللہم ارنا الحق حقا و رزقنا اتباع اللہم ارنا الباطل باطلا و رزقنا اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ سورہ الانقبوت This surah was revealed in Makkah. It has 69 verses, seven stanzas, and is the 29th by the order of arrangement. The name, uh, the surah gets its name from the verse 41, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ اتَّخْزُوا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَوْلِيَاءَ قَمَثَلِ الْآقَبُوتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning about the Anqabut, that is the spider in Arabic, and is giving a parable of the web of the, of the spider also. The time period of revelation is According to some scholars, the first 10 verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about the hypocrites are those which were revealed in Medina and the rest of them were revealed in Mecca. And in the verses between 56 to 60, they clearly show that they were revealed sometimes before the migration to Abyssinia. The topic and the main theme and summary of the surah is that uh, we know that since the surah was revealed in Mecca, and this was the time when the Muslims were being persecuted and tortured. So in such conditions, the verses were revealed to console and to guide Prophet Sallallahu and his companions, and also to give the disbelievers a strict warning. And some of the new converts in these situations, they were being forced by the, the family members to revert to the ancestral religion. So the verses, they will be, so, uh, so these, all these companions, they, were, they had queries as how to handle these social pressures of their families who were forcing them to, to revert to the ancestral religion. So their queries, the queries of all these companions under these difficult situations were answered and they were guided also. And uh, the tribesmen, they were using all forms, the tribesmen of Mecca, they were using all forms of tactics to pressurize the companions. So under these conditions, Muslims were also advised to shift to shift and to emigrate. And with emigration, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had also promised his help in the open lands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alif Lam Mim. Ahasiban Nasu. Ayyutraku ayyakulu amanna. Wahum la yuftanun. Allah says, Alif Lam Mim, do the people think that they will be left to say Amanna, we believe, and they will not be tried? So the verse which is revealed in the period of severe trials of Makkah, in this verse, Allah has clearly stated that trial is mandatory. Trial is mandatory when, when a person embraces Islam, when the person utters and the person recites and accepts la ilaha illallah, then all forms of trial, physical, social, psychological, emotional, economic trials, they will, they will be joining the life of this converted person who has converted to Islam. All the believers need to be clear that it has never, never happened and it will not also happen in future that, that a believer 
saying the Kalama Tayyaba, announcing his acceptance of Islam. And then what happens that angels will descend from heaven and place the crown, the crown of Mormon on his forehead. And he sits on a throne announcing Amanna, Amanna, and then he will be carried to the Jannah. No, no, there, there is nothing of the sort which has happened or which will happen. All such assumptions are truly false. Trial is for sure. As Allah has already, we've gone through the verse in Surah Baqarah, Allah says, Am hasiptum? Do you think that you will enter Jannah and you will not be put to trial? And similarly in Surah Baqarah, Allah said, there will be glad tiding for all who are patient. But here also Allah says, trial is mandatory. So remember, trial is a prerequisite. Trial is mandatory. And now the next thing we need to know is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the believer into trial. The first thing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to check them, wants to verify whether they are actually, actually serious. Do they who are calling themselves as the traders of Jannah, are they really serious? Do they really mean business as Allah has said? Inna Allah hashtara min al -mu'mineen. Are they really serious and they do, do they really mean business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing barter for Jannah? And the second reason is that after verification of their sincerity, Allah chooses them for his service. And then he puts them into trial. And all these trials with the purpose of brushing them up, with the purpose of brushing them up, to refine them, to polish them, to grind them. Just like when there is raw gold, from the golden ore, it is in the form of a stone, it is melted, it is heated, it is burnt in the furnace to purify it as the expensive gold we have. The raw diamond, the raw diamond in the form of a stone of diamond coming out from the diamond ore, they are, they are cut, they are grinded, and they are polished to transform them into, to transform it into what? into the valuable, precious, glittering diamonds. The more it is cut, the greater it will glitter and the greater will be its value. A pottery maker molds a pot of clay and bakes it in the oven. The longer it is heated and higher is the temperature of the oven, the better and the finer will be the porcelain, which will be made out of the pot of clay. Similarly, a team of carpenter and the team of the painter they will do what? They grind, they rub the wood. They rub it hard to make it smooth and to make it shiny. So now we can understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts to trial all his believers when he has ensured that they are sincere to him. And finally, last but not the least, when, when a believer after the trial becomes a valuable bondsman of Allah, becomes a valuable cherished servant of Allah, then Allah puts him into trial. Then Allah puts his beloved servant into trial so that when the servant stays patient and is content with the decisions of Allah, then on account of his patience, his sins will be forgiven. His shins will shed and his grades will be will be right, will rise. Like Prophet ﷺ has promised all of us that when a believer is tried and he stays patient and content, then this serves as an atonement for his sins. And he gave an example that even if a thorn hurts him and he stays patient, then his this will be an atonement for his sins. Rabbana la tuakhizna in nasina au ahtokna. Rabbana wala tahmil alayna isran kama hamaltahu ala lazina min kabilina. Rabbana wala tuhamilna ma la tuakatalana bih. 
رحفوانا واغفر لنا ورحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم القافرين اللهم اجعلني سبورا واجعلني شكورا ربنا إننا آمنا فاغفر لنا زنوبنا وقنا عذاب النار Verse number three, but we have certainly tried those before them and Allah will surely make evident those who are truthful and he will surely make evident the liars. Then Allah explains as if to console that it is not just you who have been, uh, you, you are being exposed to all forms of persecution. Previous followers of the uh, prophets were also persecuted and this is just a trial. Or, or do those who do evil deeds think they can outrun us? Evil is what they judge. Whoever should hope for meeting with Allah, indeed the term decreed by Allah is coming and he is the hearing and the knowing. And how is Allah like one of his attributes, verse six, and whoever strives only strives for the benefit of himself. Why? Because indeed Allah is free from need of the worlds. Allah is saying, Allah is a ghani. How is he free from the needs of the worlds? A hadith has been reported in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, that, O oh, sons of Adam alayhi salam, if all of you, if all of you, your predecessors and your successors, all of you, you turn like the most obedient and the pious of you, it will not increase anything in the universe of Allah. And O oh, sons of Adam alayhi salam, if all of you, your predecessors and successors, they turn like the most disobedient and the most transgressor it will not decrease anything in the creations of the universe of allah allah is ghani and those who believe and do righteous deeds we will surely remove them from their misdeeds and will surely reward them according to the best of what they used to do and we have enjoyed upon enjoined upon man goodness to parents but if they endeavor to make you associate with me that of which you have no knowledge do not obey them to me is your return and i will inform you about, about what you use to do. Now this verse number eight was revealed regarding a companion of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hazrat Saad bin Abi Waqqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When he accepted Islam, his mother, Hamna bin Sufyan, who was the niece of Abu Sufyan, she vowed. And she said that by Allah, I will not eat or drink I will not sit in the shade until and unless you, you was who? His, uh, her son. You revert to your ancestral religion, that is the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He was extremely upset because after learning about the rights of parents and the rights of mothers in Quran and Islam, he couldn't decide what to choose. He came up to Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam and asked him how to handle the situation to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then this verse was revealed to guide him of the correct manner of his obedience. And those who believe and do righteous deeds, we will surely admit them among the righteous into the paradise. And of the people are some who say, we believe in Allah, but when one of them is harmed for the cause of Allah, they consider the trial of people as if it were the punishment of Allah. But if victory comes from your Lord, they say, indeed, we were with you. It is not Allah, more, is not Allah most knowing of what is within the breast of all the creatures. And Allah will surely make evident those who believe. And he will surely make evident the hypocrites. Verse number 12. And those who disbelieve say to those who believe, follow our way and we will carry your sins but they will not carry anything of their, their sins. Indeed, they are liars. So this verse is regarding a condition when Hazrat 
Umar Raziallah Ta'ala and who he embraced Islam. And uh, after the acceptance of Islam by Hazrat Umar Raziallah Ta'ala and who the Quraysh were very upset, very upset to lose Hazrat Umar Raziallah Ta'ala and who. And then Abu Sufyan and Umayyah bin Khalf, they came over to Hazrat Umar and they tried to persuade him to revert. But, and they also promised him that if he would revert to their ancestral religion, they promised him that on the day of judgment, they will take the load of his sins. And to this suggestion has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied in this verse, guiding Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This is similar to what Allah says in Quran, la taziru waziratan vizra ukhra, nobody is going to take the load of anybody. And then in Allah, Allah in Surah Baqarah says, Laha maqasabat wa alayha maqtasabat. For everybody will be what they are going to do themselves in this worldly life. So in the next verse, till the verse number 20, 39, Allah is going to narrate the stories of Hazrat Nuh alayhi salam, Hazrat Ibrahim and Hazrat Lut alayhi salam. But they will surely carry their own burdens and others' burdens along with their burdens, and they will surely be questioned on the day of resurrection about what they used to invent. And we certainly sent Nuh alayhi salam to his people, and he remained among them a thousand years minus 50 years, that is 950 years, 600 years, 650 years before the flood, and 300 years after the flood. And the flood seized them while they were wrongdoers. But we saved him and the companions of the ship, and we made it a sign for the worlds. And we sent Ibrahim alayhi salam when he sent to his people, worship Allah and fear him. That is best for you if you know. You only worship besides Allah idols, and you produce a falsehood. Indeed, those who worship, those you worship besides Allah do not possess for you the power of provision. So seek from Allah provisions and worship him and be grateful to him. To him, you will be returned. And if you people deny the message already nations before you have denied, and there is not upon the messenger except the duty of clear notification, have they not considered how Allah begins creation and then repeats it? Indeed, that for Allah is easy. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, travel to the land and observe how he began creations and then Allah will produce the final creation. Indeed, Allah over all things is competent. He punishes whom he wills and he has mercy upon whom he wills and to him you will be returned. Rabbi ghfir warham wa anta khayru rahimeen. And you will not cause failure to Allah upon the earth or in the heaven. And you have not other than Allah any protector or helper. And the ones who disbelieve in the signs of Allah and the meeting with him, those have despaired of my mercy and they will have painful punishment. And the answer of Ibrahim's people was not, but they said, kill him or burn him, but Allah saved him from the fire. Indeed, in that are the signs for people who believe. And Ibrahim said, you have only taken other than Allah idols as a bond of affection among you in worldly life. Then on the day of resurrection, you will deny one another and curse one another and your refuge will be fire and you will not have any helpers. And Lut believed him. Ibrahim salam, said, Indeed, I will emigrate to the service of my Lord. <clears throat> Indeed, I will emigrate to the service of my Lord. Indeed, he is exalted in might, the wise. And we gave to him when what happened when Hazrat Ibrahim salam believed in the oneness of Allah, left all the worships of idols and stood up declaring and announcing against all the polytheist beliefs and stayed steadfast on Tawheed that what did Allah do? He blessed him and rewarded him here and hereafter. Allah says, we gave to him Ishaq alayhi salam and Yaqub alayhi salam and placed in him, in his descendants, prophethood and scriptures and we gave him his reward in this world and indeed he is in the hereafter among the righteous 
and men from Lud, when he said to his people, indeed, you commit such immorality as no one has preceded you with from among the worlds. Indeed, you approach men and obstruct the roads and commit in your meetings every evil. And the answer of his people was not, but they said, bring us the punishment of Allah if you should be of the truthful. He said, my Lord, support me against the corrupting people. And when our messengers came to Ibrahim with the good tidings, they said, indeed, we will destroy the people of that Luth's city. Indeed, its people have been wrongdoers. Ibrahim said, indeed, within it is loot. They said, we are more knowing of who is within it. We will surely save him and his family except his wife. She is to be of those who remained behind. And when our messengers came to Luth, he was distressed for them and felt for them great discomfort. They said, fear not nor grieve. Indeed, we will save you and your family except your wife. She is to be of those who remain behind. Indeed, we will bring down on the people of this city punishment from the sky because they have been defiantly disobedient. And we have certainly left of it a sign as a clear evidence for a people who used to reason and to Madian, we sent their brother Shu'aib, and he said, O oh, my people, worship Allah and expect the last day and do not commit abuse on the earth spreading corruption. But they denied him. So the earthquake seized them and they became within their homes, fallen, prone, and we destroyed Ad and Thamud, and it has become clear to you from their ruined dwellings. And Shaitan had made pleasing to them their deeds and averted them from the path, and they were endowed with perception. And we destroyed Karun and Pharaoh and Haman and Musa -Islam had already come to them with clear evidences and they were arrogant in the land, but they were not outrunners of our punishment. Verse number 40, so each we seized for his sin and among them were those upon whom we sent a storm of stones. Who was this? The people of Luth and among them, those who were seized by the blast from the sky. These were the people of Samud and also the people of Eka, and among them were those whom we caused the earth to swallow. These were Hasafa, were whom the people of Lut, and also whom Karun, and among them were those whom we drowned, and they were the people of Nu, and they were also the Pharaoh and his army. And Allah would not have wronged them, but it was they who were wronging themselves. Verse 41, the example of those who take allies other than Allah is like that of spider, is like that of spider who takes a home. And indeed, the weakest of homes is the home of the spider. If they only knew. So from here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now going to explain the main the main summary of the surah with an example. The main topic of the surah is that all those, that all those who will believe and follow and obey the teachings of Allah and his prophet will be successful. And on the contrary, all those who will not believe and they will disobey and transgress will fail and will be severely punished. So to prove this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now giving the example of Al Qabut, the spider, and its house, that is the web. Now the same message is being explained by this example for our day-to-day -day life. I repeat again, Allah says the example of those who take allies other than Allah is like that of spider who takes a home. And indeed, the weakest of homes is the home of the spider if they only knew. Allah explains that the people who obey and follow the guidance of those other than Allah in their personal lives, in their domestic issues, or in their marital affairs, 
then their homes will be extremely weak like the house of a spider. Families who fail to obey the guidance and orders of Quran and Hadith and follow the models of shaitan are unsuccessful, unhappy, and they have poor, they have very pure, poor mutual bonds of love and affection. Just like the web of spider collapses on a single blow or on a single touch. Similarly, such marital relationships will very easily end up in a breakup. Today, if we realize, if we realize today, the rate of divorce in the Muslim families is increasing geometrically. It is increasing geometrically, similar to what it was in the West. Marital bonds are breaking as if they were like delicate strings. The family structures are collapsing as if the houses were like what? A house of sand. We hear, we, we come to hear that a couple was married with all the lavish expenditures and millions spent on the gatherings and functions and dresses and jewelries and photo shoes and dowries and whatnot. But, but so very quickly does it end up in a divorce. It ends up in a divorce in a few months. Moreover, we also hear of a couple married since, since the last 20 years having children and all of a sudden ending up in breaking up and separating in a divorce? Why have the homes, why have the homes become so susceptible? Why are the homes and why have the marital bonds become so very weak? The reason is what this verse is rightly explaining, that when the infrastructure of the home is not built up according to the teachings of Quran, then they will tend to be unstable and they will be liable to go away and let go easily. Because you know, Quran and Hadith gives us a complete guidance for all the stages of marital affairs. For example, even before marriage, even before marriage, regarding the selection of the spouse, Prophet Wasallam, there is a tradition of the Prophet Wasallam where he has said, you marry women on four priorities, their beauty, their wealth, their family, their religion. May Allah bless you, marry women for the cause of their religion. Implying what? Implying that when choosing a spouse, looks, affluence, caste should be a second priority. Righteousness, piety, this should be what? This should be the primary priority. Similarly, Prophet Sallallahu also said that don't you marry a woman just for the sake of her beauty. It is possible that her beauty may cause her to go astray. Just don't marry a woman for the cause of her wealth. It is very possible that her wealth may misguide her. Marry women for the cause of their religion. And then Prophet Sallallahu is also told and guided all of us that if you receive the proposal of a person with whose religion, with whose religion and deen and matters you and manners you are satisfied, then accept the proposal. So these are the guidances which are which are which have been provided to all of us from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's ahadith. And not only did Prophet ﷺ give these advices for the daughters of the Ummah, he followed the same for his own daughter also. The daughter for whom Prophet ﷺ used to say, Fatima is a part of my body. Fatima anha, who used to come, Prophet ﷺ used to receive her. He used to stand up. He used to kiss her hand. He used to kiss her on her forehead. He married her when she, when she reached puberty, he married her off. And obviously we can realize that there might have been, there must have been many, many proposals of wealthy, wealthy leaders in Medina. There might have been many proposals available of all the wealthy leaders of the tribes. But whom did Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam choose for Hazrat Fatima Anha? 
Hazrat Ali radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, who was the first child to embrace Islam, who, for whom Prophet sallallahu had said, Ali is what? Ali is the door to knowledge. And Ali radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, who had received the title of Asadullah, the Lion of Allah, and whom Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had introduced to Hazrat Fatima radiallahu ta'ala and had that Fatima, I have married you to the best man of our family. But Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who was like what? He was not wealthy. He was poor. He was hand to mouth. And his friends, they had asked him and they had suggested him to ask for the hands of Hazrat Fatima radiallahu ta'ala and her from Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he went and he came to the gathering of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he would just, he would not speak and he sat quietly and Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, what is the matter? But he still kept quiet because he couldn't just say anything. He just kept quiet. And then Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Ali, what is it that you want? Why don't you ask? And then he was again silent. And then Prophet asked him, have you come to ask for Hazrat Fatima's hand? He said, yes. And then Prophet again asked, then why don't you say so? Why don't you ask for it? And then he replied, he said, Prophet I don't find, I don't find the economic resources to marry your princess. That is, I don't afford, I don't have the affordability. I don't find the economic resources to marry your princess. And immediately the Prophet ﷺ asked him that where is the armor which you got from the booty? And he brought it. It was auctioned. Hazrat Umar Usman ta'ala and who he bought it for 80 dirhams. And half of this was given to him for the arrangements of the walima. And half was given to him to give it to Hazrat Fatima ta'ala and her as her bride's gift, the Haq Mahar. So this is the model of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the model of the Sunnah regarding the priorities of selection of a spouse for the children. But as contrast to this, today in our lives, we see that when we start looking for, for a daughter-in-law, what do we look for? We look for? We look for a girl who is a rich father's daughter and we think and we imagine that she will bring a lot of dower and will furnish our house. Or then we try to look for an extremely good looking, beautiful girl who is like, who is like a model or a highly educated professional wife for our sons who will earn and who will assist in the running of the expenditures. Or we find, or we try to look for a daughter of an influential father of an influential father who, who is on a well-known post or a high fly business tycoon or renowned politician or an aristocrat who will, who will be a social support for our son to rise in this world. <coughs> and while we are looking for a husband, we are looking for a husband for our daughter or for our sister, what do we normally do? We are, we try to find out about the size of the parent's house and the locality of the parent's house. And when visiting them, we count the cars and we notice the models of the cars which have been parked in the garage of the house. And we uh, tend to look for and observe the chandeliers and the crystals and the curios in the drawing room and the cutlery and the crockery, not to miss the number of the tendons who are running around also. But what we forget to ask is, what, what we forget to try to find out and to ask is that all the wealth, the, all the wealth and the riches that, that are impressing us, are they, all, are they all lawfully earned? Whether the zakat and charity is being paid also or not? We do ask about the boy, the qualifications and the degrees, his chances of rising, his career, how pushing, how confident and how enterprising the boy is. But I'm very sorry to say, we usually forget to find out or to notice whether the boy had 
a sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu on his face, a beard or not, whether he is used to offering his salah in, as a congregation in the mosque or not. So if these are the priorities, which are totally contradictory to the priorities taught to us by Sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu and by the words of Prophet Sallallahu then obviously the marital relationship we are going to build up is going to be weak and is going to be liable to give away very soon and very easily also. Then now, the next thing, after finding a suitable match, how does Islam guide us? Islam does guide us, guide us to carry on with all the marriage and all the functions. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us that the marriage on which there has been the least of expenditures, that is, it was arranged simply, will be the most successful marriage. And how did he go about himself? He himself gave the same sunnah, proved the same sunnah while marrying himself and while the marriage of Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anha and Hazrat Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he himself delivered the sermon of nikah and the whole event was carried out in the mosque. And a few later, a few weeks later, Hazrat Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha was sent to the house of Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. There were no functions, no get togethers, no dancing, no music, no feasts, no drinks, no lightings, no decorative themes, no photo shoots, no bridal shoots, no designer bridal dresses or jewelries. And the princess of Rahmatullil Alameen, the lady who would be the leader of the ladies of Jannah, she left the compound of her father riding a camel, accompanied, simply accompanied with a slave girl and has a Salman Farsi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then in the evening after the Maghrib Salah, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he paid the newly, no, the newly wed couple a visit and he asked there for a bowl of water and he sprinkled water on both of them and made dua for their happiness and for their loving bond. And then just he came back. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa dowry to his beloved daughter was what? A model of working with his hands, the lesson of excellence for labor and hard work, the lesson and teachings of simplicity and humbleness. And then obviously the dowry to his beloved daughter was his advice, Fatima, Ali, Ali is economically constrained. Do not ask him to upset him. Subhanallah, what is this? Patience, tolerance, simplicity, self-control and humbleness. How do we go about? How do we go about today marrying our children? The moment we get an appropriate match, what happens is a lavish function. A lavish function for the engagement is arranged where all the orders of Allah are disobeyed at all the limits of Allah are crossed. Dancing, music, vulgarity, mixed gatherings, showing off, wastefulness, and what not. And then after the engagement, it is considered, it is considered permissible for them to meet. Both the girl and the boy, they think it is permissible for them to meet. And so there's dining out, hoteling, staying out late night, chatting out till midnight. All this starts and this continues till marriage. And when somebody tells them that they are not mehram, they are not mehram, this is not permissible. And when somebody advises them to refrain from all these interactions, very aggressively, very aggressively such advisors are answered. No, 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 let them interact. It is good for them. It is good for their mutual understandings. Good for their mutual understandings is something which is not lawful and permitted in Quran and according to the teachings of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How do you expect the bond of love will grow and will flourish and will get strong? And you, you know what finally happens before before they're actual, actually when the girl leaves the house of the father, actually before the marriage, 
multiple functions, customs of our society, from the societies of Hindus, from the societies of the Christians, from the society of the Jews, all put together. Everyone dancing, the bride dancing, the bride dancing with the groom's friends and cousins, and the groom dancing with the bride's friends and cousins. Astaghfirullah Rabbi. The bride's family dancing. Why are they dancing? The bride's family dancing. They have to part with their dear daughter. Dancing for what? Happy that someone has taken off the dumped garbage of their family? The groom's family dancing. The groom's family dancing might be because they are thinking that finally their worthless son did manage to get a wife. And finally on the day the bride is going to depart, what happens the whole day? She is in the parlor, makeup, styling, one after the other. And what happens is missing one salah after the other. She misses the salah of Maghrib. But why? Why? Because she cannot do wudu with her dress, with her makeup. And what happens is she departs. She departs from her parents' house without bowing, without prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was the house where she had spent her youth, where she had spent all the lovely years of her life with all the love, all the care, all the affection she was showered with. She is leaving this lovely house without even saying her prayer, Allahu Akbar. She enters the house of her in-laws, her husband, her new house for the rest of her life. How important this day is for her, her life, how her life turning day. But there has been no Quran, no recitation of Quran, no connection with Quran, no salah, no prostration. And then what happens? The bride with all her adornments, wearing the best of the dresses, makeups, perfumes, all decked up all decked up from head to toe, from head to toe, she's made to sit on a stage with flowers around her, with spotlights focused on her, just like the fairy, the fairy of the fable of fairy tales. Her face, her hair, all of her satr exposed, forgetting all the teachings and commandments of Allah, forgetting all Forgetting all these verses and all the commandments and orders and limits of Allah, she sits on the stage where all the non-mehrams, when all the non-mehrams enjoying her beauty, the friends, cousins, butlers, waiters, drivers, all of them around, enjoying the beautiful sight of her beauty. And yet those who cannot reach, thanks to all the photo shoots and thanks to all the posts on the Insta and on the Facebook, her beauty reaches all those who could not attend and see her actually sitting on the stage. One disobedience after the other. One transgression after the other goes on and on. And we think and we keep on praying that all will turn out fine. Yes, it still does work out. It still does work out in many situations purely because of the grace of Allah, purely because of the grace of Allah. But we, we did not leave any effort to disobey or any, any act of transgression. May Allah help us, guide all of us. May Allah forgive us and may Allah pardon all of us. And may Allah help, help us obey and follow all what is in the Quran and what is has been taught by Sunnah and Hadith. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zurriyatina qurrata a'yunin wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. 
Indeed, Allah knows whatever thing they call upon other than him, and he is exalted in might and wise. And these examples we present to the people, but none will understand them except those of knowledge. Allah created the heavens and the earth in truth. Indeed, in that is a sign for the believers. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Recite what has been revealed to you of the book and establish prayer. Indeed, prayer does what? Inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkir. Indeed, prayers prohibit immorality and wrongdoing and the remembrance of Allah is greater and Allah knows that which you do. So here in verse number 45, Allah is ordering salah. And again, Allah is ordering not just offering of salah, Allah is ordering the establishing of salah. And Allah is saying that here is mentioning that a person who orders salah, it will prohibit him from immorality and wrongdoings also. And uh, similar is what Prophet ﷺ has been reported to say that if anyone who wants to verify whether his salah is accepted or not, he should notice whether the salah has stopped him from immorality and wrongdoings. Similarly, Another hadith, Prophet ﷺ says that if salah of a person is not a deterrent for immorality and wrongdoings, then there is no salah. And do not argue with the people of scripture except in a way <coughs> that is best. That is best, except for those who commit injustice among them and say, we believe in that which has been revealed to us and revealed to you and our God and your God is one and we are Muslims in submission to him. And thus we have sent down to you the Quran and those to whom we, pre we previously gave the scriptures believe in it. And among these people of Mecca are those who believe in it and none reject our verses except the disbelievers. And you did not recite before it any scripture, nor did you inscribe one with your right hand. Otherwise, the falsifiers would have caused, would, uh, would have cause for doubt. Rather, the Quran is distinct verses preserved within the breasts of those who have been given the knowledge and none reject our verses except the wrongdoers. But they say, why are not the signs sent down to him from his Lord? Say, the signs are only with Allah, and I am only a clear warner. And is it not sufficient for them that we reveal to you the book which is recited to them? Indeed, in that is a mercy and reminder for people who believe. Say, sufficient is Allah between me and you as a witness. He knows what is in the heavens and earth. And they who have believed in falsehood and disbelieved in Allah, it is those who are the losers. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. And they urge you to hasten the punishment. And if you and if not for the decree of a specified term, punishment would have reached them, but it will surely come to them suddenly while they perceive not. They urge you to hasten the punishment, and indeed, help will be encompassing of the disbelievers, and on the day of punishment will cover them from above and from below their feet, and it is said, taste the result of what you used to do. O oh, my servants, who have believed, indeed, my earth is spacious, so worship only me. Verse number 57, every soul will taste death, then to us will you be returned. Allahumma a'ini ala ghamaratil maut wa sakaratil maut. And those who have believed and done righteous deeds, we will surely assign to them of paradise elevated chambers beneath which rivers flow, wherein they abide eternally. Excellent is the reward of the righteous workers. Which righteous workers? Verse 59, who have been patient and upon their lords, upon their lords they rely. 
and how many a creature carries not it not its own provision allah has provided for it and for you and he is hearing the knowing so here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this mention in this verse is mentioning that those who will enter jannah will be those who are patient and those who rely on allah reliance on allah tawakkul reliance is a spiritual form of worship of the bondsman allah is al wakil the one who is the caretaker the one whom we can rely on the one who can be depended upon tawakkul is trust on allah it is reliance on allah depending on allah means what relying on his help and support relying on his sustenance and his protection relying on his provision considering him as the attorney taking him as the guardian it is this trust in allah which allah teaches us when we say in the verse of quran surah tauba verse number 129 teaches us reliance by saying hasbi allah la ilaha illa hu alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa rabbul arshil azim sufficient is allah for me there is no god but allah and in him i have placed my trust who is the lord of the magnificent throne similarly in surah ali imran verse number 173 we say hasbun allah ni'm al maula wa ni'm al wakil allah is sufficient for us how exalted is he as a guardian now this is these verses teach us reliance and trust and dependence in allah then the next thing we need to know is what should a believer who trusts allah do and how should he believe who is reliant in allah what implications do trust of allah and reliance in allah infer in our lives reliance of allah does by no means imply that the bondsman should stop struggling should stop striving or working for achieving for achieving the goals and targets of life or working hard for earning livelihoods like people saying that uh, we do not need to work hard for earning our livelihoods saying that we have tawakkul in allah and we have reliance in allah in the provider and he will provide us and he will feed us and he is the sustainer and sit hands off all forms of work no tawakkul does not mean this reliance does not mean this reliance is it means what it means to work to struggle to endure to one's utmost capacity obviously very obviously within the permissible limits and then to have reliance in allah and then to have reliance in allah that he will help he will support he will guide he will protect and he will provide what whatever wherever whenever whichever will be the best for us so this is exactly the way we need to rely and depend on allah and have our tawakkul in allah our struggles our efforts our endeavors will be fruitful and then we will do all these things and then we will rely on allah lack of trust in allah is what it is actually trying to resort to unlawful earnings a person if he tries to earn his livelihood by forbidden or by haram or by unlawful methods is exhibiting lack of trust and lack of reliance because he does not trust rabbul alamin he is not having reliance in the razik and the razak for his provision and sustenance by halal methods person having fear of allah person having the trust of allah will refrain from all forms of unlawful methods of earnings will not resort or will not even think of resorting to any forbidden deed for earning and for for treating up sick or for any any worldly goal because 
they will rely on Allah that if we stick to the lawful manners and if we stick to the limits of Allah, even then Allah who is the sustainer and who is the creator and who is the Razik and Razak will still provide to us. And this is the method of reliance we need to adopt in our lives. If you ask them, who created the heaven and the earth and subjected the sun and the moon, they would surely say, Allah, then how are you deluded? Allah extends provisions for whom he wills of his servants and restricts for him. Indeed, Allah is of all things knowing. And you, if you ask them, who sends down the rain from the sky and gives life thereby to the earth after its lifelessness, they would surely say, Allah, say praise to Allah. But most of them do not reason. And this worldly life is not but diversion and amusement. And indeed, the home of hereafter is that is eternal, if only they knew. And when they board a ship, they supplicate Allah, sincere to him in religion. But when he delivers them to the land, at once they associate others with him so that they will deny what we have granted them and they will enjoy themselves, but they are going to know. Have they not seen that we made Makkah a safe sanctuary while people are being taken away all around them? Then in falsehood, do they believe? And in the favor of Allah, they disbelieve. And who is more unjust than the one who invents a lie about Allah or denies the truth when it has come to him? Is there not in hell a sufficient residence for the disbelievers and those who strive for us? We will surely guide them to our ways. And indeed, Allah is with the doers of good. So the concluding note that those who strive and struggle make effort in the path of Allah will be guided towards the right path. Allahumma ikhtina sirat al-mustaqeem. Surah al-Qasas. Surah ar rum This surah was revealed in Mecca. It has six stanzas, 60 verses, and it is the 30th by the order of revolution. The name of the surah is because of the second verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, room. the time period of the revolution is 615 AD, because this is the historical time of the events which are being mentioned. And uh, the verses in which they were revealed is before uh, the prophethood of uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after the prophethood of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, when all these events that took place, the verses were revealed then. And the main theme of the whole of the surah is to invite people towards faith on the oneness of Allah for belief on hereafter and negation of all forms of polytheism and to warn all those who are indulging in polytheism and consoling the companions of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alif Lam Mim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif Lam Mim, the Byzantines have been defeated in the nearest land, but they, after their defeat, will overcome. Within three to nine years, to Allah belongs the command before and after, and that day the believers will also rejoice in the victory of Allah. Believers will rejoice what? In the victory of Allah. He gives victory to whom he wills, and he is the exalted in might and merciful. It is the promise of Allah. Allah does not fail in his promise, but most of the people do not know. They know what is apparent of the worldly life, but they, of the hereafter, are unaware. So in the verse 1 to 7, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commenting on a historical event which took place in the life during the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Mecca. So to understand what Allah is explaining in these initial verses is to we would need to understand the historical background to uh, understand the state of affairs or the international politics of the time. In the time when these verses were revealed, there were basically two superpowers of the time, the Romans, who were the Christians, the Byzantine Empire, which was a Christian state, and they were led by the Morris or the Kassar of Rome. The second was the Iranian state. They were the fire worshippers, and they were led by Hercules or Hercul. And uh, like always, there had been a tussle of power with series of endless wars. Now, during all the wars, the sympathies of the people of Mecca, the polytheists of Mecca, they were with the Iranians because they were common in their polytheist beliefs, worshipping other than Allah. And the sympathies of the Muslims throughout, they were with the Christians because obviously the Christians, they were the people of the book and they believed in Allah and they believed in the angels and the prophets and the day of judgment. So because of their common uh, points of belief, the, uh, the sympathies of the Muslims were with the Romans. Now, when this surah was revealed, the Iranians had defeated the Romans, as Allah is saying here, only but their room. And the people of Mecca, they were rejoicing they were very happy and they were rejoicing. And not only were they happy and rejoicing, at the same time, they also were mocking the Muslims. And the Muslims were obviously because of the defeat of the Romans and the victory of the polytheists, the Muslims were depressed and the Muslims were upset at the defeat of the people of the book. And they were moreover also being taunted and mocked by the people of Madin, uh, Mecca. And the people of Mecca were telling them that just look, look like this situation, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has supported the fire worshippers of Iran and defeated the believers of prophets soon, soon will Allah do the same, do the same with the people of Mecca and with the Muslims of Mecca also. And the Muslims of Mecca, they will soon meet a bad fate. And the Muslims and the Meccans, they will exterminate Islam and they will finish off all the Muslims very soon. But with all this mocking and taunting which the Muslims were, uh, were receiving, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoled the Muslims. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised and consoled the Muslims what we have read in all these verses. Because Allah said that although currently the Romans have been defeated, but soon they will, with the help of Allah, become victorious. And Allah not only gave the good news that the Romans will come out victorious with the help of Allah, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gave another good news of another promise that the Muslims will also at the same period be rejoicing their victories. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given two good news. That is number one, the Romans will come out victorious. And when the Romans will be victorious, similarly on the same time period also, the Muslims will be rejoicing their victories. Now, these good news and these prophesizings were coming in such an initial period of the life of Prophet Sallallahu that this was seeming like next to impossible. But Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala was promising this and was prophesizing this, he who is Allah al -Ghayub. And then the whole happenings did come out to be true. All these promises of Allah, very soon they came out to be true. Proving what? The words of Allah, are always true. And the prophecies of Allah, Allahul Ghayub, they are always, they will be turned out to be true. They prove the powers, the attributes, and the authorities of Allah. It also proves the truth of the prophethood of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it also proves the truth of the verses of Quran. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
All this proves what? It proves the truth of the verses of Quran that they are from, they are from Allah Almighty himself. So what happened was, as we will trace down history was that victories of the Romans and the Muslims, they went hand in hand and they came parallel to each other. Like the second year after the immigration of Prophet to Medina, Muslims were blessed with the victory of Battle of Badr. And similarly, at the same time, Hercules, he attacked and he was victorious to demolish the principal fire temple of Iran. Then in sixth year after the immigration from Mecca, there was the Treaty of Hadebia was signed between the Muslims and the people of Mecca. And this Treaty of Hadebia has been called in Quran as Fathum Mubin, a clear cut open victory for the Muslims. And then similarly, in the same year, Khusro Parvez was assassinated and was killed by the Romans. And they entered, they entered and they got control of the Iranian capital city. The Romans did this. Now, in the eighth year of uh, the migration of Prophet to Medina, what did he receive? The, the remarkable conquest of Makkah. And on the eighth AH also, what happened with the Romans was that Bethel Maqdas in Palestine was acquired by the Romans back and the true cross was restored. So both the victories of the Romans and the Muslims, they went hand in hand and they were parallel in time also. So uh, when the revolutions of these verses had come, there was no remotest chance of such victories for either groups. And what happened was that Ubay bin Kaf, Ubay bin Kaf had betted 10 camels with Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu if Romans were victorious within the next three years. And when Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard that uh, this bet had been made, he uh, told Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu that Quran is saying biz asinin. And in Arabic, biz asinin means eight to 10 years. So he asked Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu to make a bet for 10 years and to increase the number of camels to 100. And so Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he spoke to Ubay bin Kaf and he increased the bet to 100 and increased the time to eight to 10 years. And, uh, but this was an initial period of Makkah where betting was not unlawful and was not considered as uh, prohibited. <coughs> So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make us understand from all these verses and from the main theme of the surah is that man is accustomed to see only what is apparent and superficial. And man himself does not know and does not relate to what is behind the apparent and what is behind the superficial. This manner this manner leads to what? It leads to misunderstandings and this leads to miscalculation. And the person becomes liable to make wrong estimates because of the lack of knowledge and about because of the lack of knowledge of what will happen tomorrow. So whatever happens is with the will of Allah who is all wise, who is all knowing, seeing, hearing. So if something is coming by the will of the wise Allah, then we need to stay content. We do not need to get upset because we are just knowing and we are just comprehending the apparent and the superficial aspects of something. And in the deeper and in the original aspects, there will be some goodness for us in future and we need to stay content and we need to stay patient. And there's no need to get upset when there is some apparently uh, crisis and when there is some superficial hardships in our lives. Do they not contemplate within themselves? Allah has not created the heavens and the earth and what is between them except in truth for a special term. And indeed, many of the people in matter of the meeting with their lords are disbelievers. Have they not traveled to the earth and observed how was the end of those before them? 
they were greater than them in power and they plowed the earth and built it up more than they have built it up and their messengers came to them with clear evidences and Allah would not ever have wronged them but they were wronging themselves then the end of those who did evil was the worst consequence because they denied the signs of Allah and used to ridicule them Allah begins creation and then he will repeat it and then to him you will be returned and the day of the hour appears the criminals will be in despair and there will not be for them among their alleged partners any intercessors and they will then be disbelievers in their partners and the day the hour appears the day they will become separated and as for those who had believed and done righteous deeds they will be in a garden of paradise delighted but as for those who disbelieved but as for those who disbelieved and denied our verses and the meeting of hereafter those will be brought into punishment to remain so in all these verses from verse number eight till here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining all the signs of the universe to prove the doctrine of hereafter, to prove the belief in the oneness of Allah and to negate all forms of polytheism. Allah continues saying, so exalted is Allah when you reach the evening and when you reach, so exalted is Allah when you reach the evening and when you reach the morning and to him is due all the praises throughout the heavens and the earth and exalted is he at night when you are at noon. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. He brings the living out of the dead and he brings the dead out of the living and brings to life the earth after it is lifeless and thus you will be brought out. And of his signs is that he created you from dust and then suddenly you were human beings dispersing throughout the earth. And of his signs is that he created from for you from yourselves mates that you may find tranquility in them and he placed between you affection and mercy indeed in that are signs for people who give thought so in this verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained the purpose of creating mates the purpose of creating mates has been explained as that this will be a relationship a bond a person where they will mutually find peace of mind and tranquility and love and mercy but remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just does not teach us and inform us of the purpose of making mates, but instead also teaches us the manners of how to achieve this basic purpose. He gives us orders of mutual marital affection and domestic matters. How do we need to go about them to achieve this goal? Like Allah says in the Quran, Allah guides for this mutual affection and for the husband and wife being a source of peace and contentment and tranquility for each other. Allah has suggested in Quran, Hunna libasullakum wa antum libasullahunna. See, O believers, O men, you are the dress for your for your wives and these wives are a dress for you. We've talked about this in Quran previously. And then Allah guides Allah says, addressing the men, Nisa'ukum harthullakum. These wives of yours are what? They are, they are hirsullakum. And then Allah guides the men folk, the Muslim men, he guides, Ashiruhunna bil maruf, relate to them, socially interact to them in a manner which is very, very merciful and in a manner of righteousness, piousness, and goodness. And then Allah instructs, All men, they have a superiority and they have a position above the, all their women. And then Allah explains the traits of wives, of good Muslim wives, as as-salihat, qanitat, hafizat. This is all done. Why? This is to teach all the Muslim men and women their marital affairs and their domestic affairs to achieve a mutual bond in which they will be a source of peace and a source of contentment and tranquility for each other. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining here that he is, he makes the mates and the spouse a source of affection and attraction. When is this? In, in the year or in the period of youth, when there is a physical attraction and there is a mutual physical desire also and become a source of mercy and love when in the old age. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zurriyatina qurrata ayunin wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. And of his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the diversity of your languages and your colors. Indeed, in that are the signs for those of knowledge. And of his signs is your sleep by night and day and your seeking of his bounty. Indeed, in that are the signs for people who listen. Allahumma ja'alla minhum. And of his signs is that he shows you the lightning causing fear and aspiration as he sends down the rain from the sky by which he brings to the brings to life the earth after its lifelessness. Indeed, in that are signs for people who use reason and of his signs is that the heaven and the earth remain by his command. Then when he calls you with a single call from the earth, immediately you will come forth. And to him belongs whoever is in the heavens and the earth and all are to him devoutly obedient. And it is he who begins creation and he who repeats it. And that is even easier for him. What? repeating and resurrection to him belongs the highest attribute in the heavens and the earth and he is exalted in might and wise subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah al azim he presents to you an example from yourselves do you have among those whom your right hands possess that is your slaves any partners in what we have provided for you so that you are equal therein and would fear them as you, as your fear of another within partnership. Thus, do we detail the verses for people who use reason. So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making, uh, making clear that in the worldly life, in our worldly lives, we can understand comprehend and we can also maintain the difference between the master and the slave we can we can do all this i repeat again that in this worldly life we understand we comprehend and we also very much we are mindful of maintaining the difference between the masters and the slaves but somehow or the other we tend to get confused and we lose clarity regarding the understanding and maintaining the difference between the masters of the world and his slaves, his bondsmen, the creator of the world and his creation. So what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explaining here is that we need to be mindful to have faith in the oneness of Allah and to stay away from all forms of polytheism. But those who, who wrong, but those who wrong follow their own desires without knowledge, then who can guide one whom Allah has sent astray are for them, uh, there are no helpers. So direct your face towards religion, inclining to the truth, adhere to the fitra of Allah upon which he has created all people. No change should there be in the creation of Allah that is the correct religion, but most of the people do not know. Adhere to it, turning in repentance to him and fear him and establish prayer and do not be of those who associate others with Allah or of those who have divided their religion and become sects, even every faction rejoicing in what it has. And when adversity touches the people, they call upon their Lord, turning in repentance to him. Then when he lets them taste mercy for him, at once a party of them associates others with their Lord, so that they will deny what we have granted them. Then enjoy yourselves, for you are going to know. Or have we sent down to them an authority, and it speaks of what they were associating with him? 
And when we let the people taste mercy, they rejoice therein. But evil, but if evil afflicts them for what their hands have put forth, immediately they despair. Do they not see that Allah extends provisions for whom he wills and restricts it? Indeed, in that are signs for people who believe. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. So give the relative his right, as well as the needy and the traveler that is the best for those who desire the countenance of Allah, and it is they who will be the successful. And whatever you give for interest to increase within the wealth of people will not increase with Allah. But what you give in zakah, desiring the countenance of Allah, those are the multipliers. So in this verse number 39, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this has revealed this verse regarding interest, the order of Allah and the, the concept of Allah regarding interest and usury. In this verse, this was the first verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about his dislike and disapproval about riba or usury. Allah has just condemned it and Allah has just shown a dislike, but the verse has not actually made uh, usually or riba is unlawful. That has been talked about in the verses of Surah Al-Imran and Surah Al-Baqarah, which we have already discussed. And so after the revelation of the verses of Surah Al-Imran and Surah Al-Baqarah, this verse is annulled. It is very much there in the Quran. We recite it, people memorize it. We recite it in our salah, in the congregational salah, in the tarawi, and it is there very much there in the Quran, but we will not be deriving orders of Allah from this verse since it is annulled. Allah is the one who created you, then provided for you, then will cause you to die, and then will give you life. And there any, are there any of your partners who do who does anything of that? Exalted is he and high above what they associate with him. Corruption has appeared throughout the land and by the sea by reason of what the hands of people have earned. So he may let them taste the part of the consequence of what they have done, that perhaps they will return to righteousness. Say, travel through the land and observe how was the end of those before. Most of them were associators of others with Allah. So you do what? You direct your face towards the correct religion before a day comes from Allah of which there is no repelling that day. They will be divided. Divided as how? Whoever will disbelieve upon him is the consequence of his disbelief and whoever does righteousness, they are for themselves preparing that he may reward those who have believed and done righteous deeds out of his bounty. Indeed, he does not like the disbelievers. And of his signs is that he sends the wind as a bringer of good tidings, which good tidings the rainfall, and to, and to let you taste his mercy, and so the ships may sail at his command, and so you may seek of his bounty, and perhaps you will be grateful. And we have already sent messengers before you to their people, and they came to them with clear evidences. And then we took retribution from those who committed crimes, and incumbent upon us was the port of believers. It is Allah who sends the wind, and they stir the clouds, and spread them in sky, however he wills. And he makes them fragments, so you, so you see the rain emerge from within them. And when he causes it to fall upon whom he wills of his servant, immediately they rejoice although they were before it was sent although they were before it was sent down upon them before that in despair so observe the effects of mercy of Allah how he gives life to the earth after its lifelessness indeed that same one will give life to the dead and he is over all things competent but if we should send a bad wind and they saw their crops turned yellow, they would remain thereafter disbelievers. So indeed, you will not, 
you will not make the dead hear, nor will you make the deaf hear the call when they turn back retreating. And you cannot guide the blind away from their error. You will only make hear those who believe in our verses so they are Muslims in submission to Allah. Allah is the one who created you from weakness and then made you, made after weakness, strength, then made after, after strength, weakness, and right here. The first weakness is the weakness of childhood. And then the next strength is the strength of the youth. And the final weakness and the white hair is what is the old age. He creates what he wills and he is knowing the competent. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us the supplication to save ourselves from the, from the hardships and the difficulties of old age. He used to supplicate, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ardhalil umar. And the day of the hour appears, the criminals will swear they had remained but an hour. Thus, they were deluded. But those who were given knowledge and faith will say, you remain the extent of Allah's decree until the day of resurrection. And this is the day of resurrection. But you did not use to know so that they, their excuses will not benefit those who wronged, nor will they be asked to appease Allah. And we have certainly presented to the people in this Quran from every kind of example, but if you should bring them a sign, the disbelievers will surely say, you believers are but falsifiers. Thus, does Allah seal the heart of those who do not know? So do what? Be patient. Indeed, the promise of Allah is truth. And let them not disquiet you who are certain in faith. Allahumma ja'alni saburam wa ja'alni shakura wa ja'alni fi aini saghira wa fi a'yunin nasi kabira. ربنا لا تزع قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك الرحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يسكون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين سمامين